Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Doug Evans, Chair of the Department of Surgery at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and welcome to our weekly program on innovations in the Department of Surgery here at MCW. And today I'm thrilled to have Mark DeMoya, who is soon to be our Division Chief of Trauma, Critical Care, and Acute Care Surgery here at uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin, coming to us from Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and Harvard Medical School. Mark will start uh, next month running our uh, a division of uh, trauma and acute care surgery. Uh, Mark did his surgical training at St. Barnabas Medical Center in New Jersey, followed by a fellowship in trauma at Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami, part of the University of Miami system. He was then recruited to Massachusetts General Hospital in 2005, where he has been up until now being recruited to uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And Mark, we're thrilled to have you here in Milwaukee. And maybe we can talk for a couple minutes on, on just the importance of fellowship training in your specialty of trauma. And now it, it's amazing how surgery has evolved to now having trauma, critical care, and acute care surgery being a defined specialty within the spectrum of surgery. But maybe you can talk a little bit about the importance of fellowship training and then the specialty itself. Sure. So. The way, the way trauma surgery is set up, you do the five years of general surgery, of course, and that's followed by the two years of fellowship training. The two years of fellowship training is, uh, consists of a year of critical care, which is focused on surgical critical care, um, which really is you know, where you really become more expert in the, uh, the intensive care unit, the care of the really critically ill patient. And that could be any kind of patient. It could be any kind of surgical patient. Uh, surgical disease, not just trauma. Um, and then that's followed by a year that's really focused on trauma and emergency general surgery. Um, in the past, it's been focused on trauma uh, and emergency general surgery has actually been uh, something that the trauma surgeons would cover in sure. many institutions. Um, but uh, over time, it became kind of a an easy marriage between the two. Sure. Um, and um, so you had n people graduating from these fellowships who were not only expert in taking care of trauma patients, but also expert in taking care of emergency general surgery patients. And, um, and emergency general surgery, what that means is because... And really, it, although in the Midwest they oftentimes use acute care surgery as the term, on the East Coast emergency surgery, it's, it's all basically the same. Right, so, so the acute care surgery, um, the way it's currently used uh, uh, in, you know, kind of on national front, is really an umbrella um, uh, phrase that covers trauma, emergency general surgery, and surgical critical care. So there's three facets of that. Sure. Um, but, um, uh, and so you will hear it on occasions, you know, termed trauma and acute care surgery. Um, but, uh, and, but so it can be a little confusing. Emergency general surgery is really under that umbrella though. Sure. Well, maybe we could focus on each of those three areas for our listeners because I think this is a, just such an important topic and, and it's an area really that, that characterizes some of the more contemporary changes in healthcare and medicine. Freighter Hospital, uh, which we are in right now, is the only level one trauma center in uh, southeastern Wisconsin. And therefore, uh, patients who have life-threatening auto accidents, uh, certainly people who have uh, traumatic injuries, falling from a ladder, uh, they might be out on their uh, bicycle and they're hit by a car, but with life-threatening injuries, people who obviously have penetrating trauma, such as gunshot wounds and, and stabbings, would all come here. And the level one designation means that you have an entire system and team to care for them. Maybe you could expand upon that a little bit. Sure, so uh, the, the level of the trauma designation comes from a national organization called the American College of Surgeons um, or from the state. Um, and in essence, we meet both uh, designations. And in essence, what that tells f folks is that we're the highest level of centers that can receive the sickest of the sick uh, patients, whether they're trauma patients or uh, but this is focused on trauma, um, and you're right. It, it 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 in essence says that we have a whole system in place. So meaning, 
uh, not just the surgeons, uh, the trauma surgeons, but also the neurosurgeons, the orthopedic surgeons. We have specialized nursing. We have specialized intensive care units. Um, we have operating rooms that are available 24 hours a day at the, uh, the drop of a hat. We can get an open operating room if we need it. Um, I know that here at, at Freighter Hospital, there's, there's a, a couple bays in the emergency room that are dedicated just to the trauma patient. Yep. The L, they, you have the CT scanner, the x-ray machine, um, and the elevator that is right there that immediately takes the patient up to um, fairly famous room six, which is the trauma room in our current OR, although it's all being, uh, being redone right now. And I think that just that, that immediate care of the patient who can come in uh, really with a life-threatening injury and be in the operating room, you know, I think certainly TV shows try to recapitulate this for the listener, but it truly can be instantaneously, in, instantaneously done. Absolutely. So, so uh, time is of the essence uh, in these patients. And so having everything all ready uh, and set up in a team that's well-trained and used to this kind of uh, patient um, uh, makes things move a lot quicker. And, you know, the quicker we get to stabilize the patient and stop bleeding and, 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 and help to stabilize fractures and that sort of thing, uh, get them to the intensive care unit if they need to go to the intensive care unit, the better the chances that they have to survive and also limit the amount of uh, disability that they might have as a result of the trauma. And emergency general surgery has kind of been a natural um, uh, uh, kind of is related to that because it is also of time is of the in essence in those patients as well. So having the resources that can go to those patients, assess those patients really quick, um, and then uh, intervene if need be uh, as quickly as possible is, is key. So examples of emergency general surgery would be, for example, uh, in a non-trauma situation, would be a perforated ulcer, uh, very bad diverticulitis, um, ex bad cholecystitis, uh, some form of uh, intestinal blockage or a blood clot sent to the in intestine. Those kind of common areas, diverticulitis, cholecystitis, bowel obstruction or perforation, that does that am yeah, I there's somewhat a, in the in the absolutely. sphere there? There's a bucket that you you know that of emergency general surgery that basically has exactly what you're 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 talking about, and in essence uh, these are operations or these are conditions that need to be um, uh, intervened upon really within certainly within 24 hours, uh, sometimes within hours, and um, and you know if somebody has a really bad bleed that's ongoing and they need to go uh, to have some intervention to stop that bleeding. Um, that's also a, another type of emergency that uh, could be related to a, a, a bleed inside the intestine. So, so they're, they're, that, that, that bucket and the trauma bucket are very similar in terms of the, the uh, intensity of the resources that are needed in a very quick uh, manner. And, um, and, so, and that's what we have here at Freighter to be able to provide that for our patients in this community is uh, really important and is a huge value uh, to the community. Because I know that, uh, that certainly during the day, you have a dedicated surgeon who is, uh, who is responsible just for trauma or just for, critical, for surgical critical care or just for emergency surgery. And then at night, one or two surgeons in the hospital 24 hours a day so that you can see how the how really time becomes becomes not an issue as as someone who's um, been in the field of surgery for a long time I, I it's been fascinating to see this the whole field of emergency general surgery evolve and as you as you said it it really evolved because of the simple clinical observation that we really needed to treat some of these patients with belly pain and other acute emergencies similar to how you would treat a gunshot uh, wound, someone who has been shot or stabbed or been in a bad car accident, and yet that was really not happening until this, w this whole area was carved out as a separate specialty, correct? And it also, um, not just the, the uh, you know, what you do in the operating room or what you do in the emergency room, but also then having expertise and knowledge about 
um, about what happens afterwards, you know, in terms of the, the intensive care part of it. What, what sort of inflammation response does the body have? Because, um, you know, you may have a problem in your belly or you may have, a, you may have been shot in your leg or may uh, have been in a bad car accident and have head injury, um, but your entire body is affected by that. And we see the results of that, uh, the impact of that, the physiological impact uh, on the rest of the body and that's what we deal with and our expert in t and handling in the intensive care unit. Um, and the other piece of this uh, on top of the clinical part, which is super important uh, for the, to be a level one uh, center, uh, is also the research aspect. So learning more about these disease processes sure. um, is also uh, uh, a requirement. Um, for these level one trauma centers um, to, to do. So that's something that we're very much uh, active in, um, learning what's the future and what are the future treatments uh, and the cutting edge of uh, providing <coughs> trauma uh, care and emergency general surgery care. Um, as many of the listeners know, I'm, I'm a surgical oncologist, so I'm spending a fair amount of time, certainly uh, uh, at night, weekends, and almost many waking moments thinking about cancer. And one of the ways I have phrased the whole research uh, question is, is through advocacy. Um, obviously, we try to practice medicine the best way we can for the patient of today, and we have to look at innovation, discovery, and research to fulfill our advocacy and obligation to the patient of tomorrow. You have probably done this, uh, and by you I mean your, the entire field, especially of critical care and trauma, and now it's moving into acute care surgery better than almost um, any other field, uh, perhaps even better than, than cancer, where research has been a cornerstone of our treatment programs forever. But we, we had our um, end of the year Lunda lectureship uh, just this week, and it was all about um, research-driven patient care in the intensive care unit, and, um, and made everyone realize that that what we think may be true and the best way to treat a, a patient may actually not be the case when it is subjected to very rigorous research studies. And it, this, was, this was with respect to how to manage the breathing machine or the ventilator, how to give the appropriate amount of fluids to patients. Maybe you could talk about the advances that, um, that translational research and clinical trials have made to the care of the critically ill patient in the intensive care unit who's on, um, the lay public would say, multiple machines. They're on a breathing machine, they may be on drugs to keep their blood pressure up, all of that. Yeah, it, you know, as you point out, the, the, it's, it's such a complex system. Uh, there's so many uh, pieces to this puzzle um, and it's ever evolving. And so the more that we learn about each one of these pieces, the better the outcomes can be. And to give you a specific example, um, you know, one of the things that was, was described in, our, uh, in the lecture that was not too long ago, or, or just uh, yesterday, uh, by Dr. Napolitano was uh, focused on um, the, the, the breathing machine, the ventilator. And by changing how we treat patients with really severe inflammation of the lungs, uh, we've been able to increase their survival dramatically, almost twofold. Uh, and uh, over the last 20 years. And so, especially over the last 15 years, we've really kind of uh, increased our uh, ability to get people to survive. Not only survive, but also to, uh, you know, have limited disability. Um, because, you know, that's another part of our, the care that we render. It's not just good enough to get somebody through something. Sure. It's, it's we, I, I want to get patients back to their, their quality of life that they were having before, as close as that as possible. Um, and, um, and so that's, that's another aspect of what we do, which is so important. But research is uh, really key to moving uh, this forward. If we don't have research, if we don't investigate, if we don't ask the questions, are we doing the right thing? Sure. Over and over and over again, it's so easy for us to get caught into the same, doing into a rut, you know, and, and doing the same thing uh, time and time again. When in fact, as things evolve and as technology evolves, as medications evolve, we can actually, we have better ways of doing things. And, um, 
uh, and that's a constant struggle. And that's something that's, that's our mission, uh, you know, um, to really understand that and to be able to provide the cutting edge and best care possible. And, and, abs and make progress. Yeah. I mean, certainly for the, from the standpoint of families, I mean, oftentimes the patient who comes in, certainly the trauma patient who comes in is, is frequently unconscious or not aware of what's going on. Uh, the patient who is acutely ill and may require emergency abdominal surgery may be in a, in a similar situation. They may be, be varying between consciousness and, and not quite knowing where they are. But certainly the family is very aware of everything. And for the, for the family member to, fi to be uh, comforted that there is um, a Cracker Jack team available, whether it's two in the afternoon or two in the morning, and with respect to the intensive care unit, that you have a, a team of highly informed um, uh, doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists. I mean, that, in, that entire, that redundancy of personnel provides tremendous safety. And maybe you can, maybe we can conclude with, uh, with a few minutes on just if, if there's a critically ill patient in the intensive care unit, the number of different professionals that touch that patient and double check and triple check everything that is being done to them. Absolutely, uh, you know, we have everything from our, our trainees um, who are, you know, in the midst of their training for surgery um, or emergency medicine in the intensive care unit. Um, where we have nurses uh, that are specialized in intensive care. We have doctors, we have respiratory therapists, nutritionists, uh, pharmacists, pharmacists um, you know, um, these, and also social workers, um, people who, and, and the entire team is really focused around not just the patient, as you pointed out, it's not just the patient, it's also the family. Um, being, uh, being able to provide support for the family who's really going through uh, a very difficult time. Oftentimes, you know, when patients are in the intensive care unit or their trauma patients or even emergency general surgery patients, the, none of this is planned. You know, exactly. a lot of this, all this happens, you know, it's, it's, it's a tragedy, um, but it happens and um, it's not planned. It's, there's no set time for it to happen. And that's why we're here 24 hours a day. Um, but um, it can be extremely emotionally upsetting, uh, stressful uh, and disruptive to people's lives. Um, so we're here not just for the patient and to, and to talk about what's best for the patient and help the patient through it, but also the family. Um, and so this entire team working together is, uh, uh, is what provides the level of care sure. that um, certainly you or I would want for our own family. I was talking to someone last night who mentioned that their, that their husband was in the intensive care unit here and, um, and she was was so comforted by the fact that she knew the, that, the, that the attention to him 24 hours a day was, was just so meticulous that she could focus on all of the other aspects that were important to the family. One, holding her husband's hand and then also dealing with her children and other family members, which um, was such an important perspective. But uh, Mark, thank you so much for spending time with us on this My pleasure. video. Thank you also uh, for having um, uh, uh, faith and uh, tr a tremendous level of uh, energy and enthusiasm in the Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, Freighter Hospital. And uh, we're thrilled that you're joining us uh, from Boston and we know that you'll uh, love Milwaukee, uh, Lake Michigan, and you'll come to be a tremendous uh, Brewers fan, as well as uh, we know a Packer and a Bucks fan. Absolutely, uh, all right. Thanks very much, Mark. And I would encourage all of you to uh, feel free to uh, email uh, Dr. DeMoya, contact him uh, on the information that will provided you, be provided to you at the end of this video. Thanks very much for joining us.